minor prophets. You know, I, I like the prophets. I like the minor prophets. <clears throat> the reason I do is, even though some of the language may be uh, obscure to us because we don't talk the same way they do, we don't write the same way, we do things differently. But it demonstrates to us <clears throat> how God views sin, unrighteousness, and it doesn't matter who does it. No one will escape that. So it's good for us to uh, have an understanding of how the prophets dealt with the religious and political and social moral corruptions of that day. And once we know that and how God deals with it and what the consequences of this disobedient and righteousness uh, are, then we understand the principles on which God will deal with that today and make no mistake about it. We are as subject to the uh, God's wrath or punishment or correction, whatever you want to call it, as were these uh, nations of old. No different. So I think it would be a, a profitable study. Uh, I think it's important for us to understand how God deals with this and how God possibly may deal with it today. And that may be that you may never see it in your time and see the uh, consequences of the immorality of this country or any country for that matter. You may not see it in your time, but it will happen. It will happen. We're going to use as a um, text, if you will, for this study, the uh, book on minor prophets by Homer Haley. If you happen to have that, you can get it and follow along if, you, if you'd like to. Now, the way that he uh, approaches this study, he does not do it in the same order as it appears in the Old Testament in our Old Testament books, but on the basis of the best that he can determine the age of the writings. And, of course, there's some question about when these were actually written. But prophets were something that God raised up in the times of moral and spiritual uh, repression or conflict, decay. And he rose up these prophets and he put the word that he wanted to declare to the people that he, he was addressing, wanting to address. And the purpose of that was to get them to turn back to himself. Of course, it did not always work, and probably only in a few circumstances did it work. And, but he did disclose the principles on which he would act towards people. And it didn't matter if it was his own people or the uh, heathens. He has a care and concern for all people. We'll see that, of course quite clearly in the book of Jonah. He used the prophets to declare to the people that which they did not want to be declared to them. They didn't want to hear it. But they did it anyway. They declared the infinite uh, power of God, his knowledge, his uh, care and concern, his wisdom, his understanding and his desire for them to repent. His principles never change. That's why it's a good thing for us to study uh, 
than of the minor prophets or the prophets in general because his principles never change. Never have changed. They apply today just as they did back then. So if we can understand how he applied those principles back then, then we can understand how he applies those principles today. <clears throat> and there's another reason that I like the prophets. In particular, I guess, uh, maybe the minor prophets, but really all of them. And that is because of the uh, beauty and majesty of the way that things were presented, the language of the time. Like I say, there are some things that are said that are obscure to us. And that's why we can benefit from a scholar who has studied these things. But there are just uh, some passages that are just uh, sublime in their uh, declarations, something that is just uh, beautiful to, to read. If you're a student of the written word, you will certainly appreciate that. <clears throat> and you must keep in mind that in all these writings, in all these uh, prophetic writings, God is trying to make his will known to the people. In some cases, they sh should have known what his will was, but they didn't. They pursued their own interest. Let's look at uh, the instructors in the, the uh, Old Covenant. There are different types of instructors, if you will. Of course, the most prominent instructor was Moses himself. He was kind of one of a kind. He's a prophet, a lawgiver, a wise man, and so forth. But he was the only one. He was the only lawgiver of the Old Covenant. There's also um, what's called wise men, and their purpose was to give counsel. They were to give sound advice on matters of life and other things of importance. And it's interesting to note that the first wise anybody was a woman. Second Samuel 14, chapter, verses 1 through 24. And it's also an uh, interesting note that the second wise person that's mentioned is also a woman. Second Samuel 20, chapter, verses 16 through 22. So I know that uh, women possess why, wisdom also. The most outstanding and wise man of Israel, of course, was uh, Solomon. The wise men did not appeal directly to the conscience as did the prophets, but rather they, they appealed to the mind, to the reasoning through counsel and argument. Now, their ultimate aim, of course, was to reach the conscience and through it influence conduct and life. Third uh, instructor was the priest. Now, the, the, the special function of the priest was uh, related to the law, of course. Uh, the law was, in the Old Testament, the law was both civil and ecclesiastical. So their function was uh, twofold. First, it was to declare, interpret, and teach the law. Second, it was to tend to the sacrificial duties. Now, consequently, because of that the function that they performed, when there was apostasy, the priests were uh, at least in a large measure, uh, responsible 
for that apostasy. And that's why we should always desire and demand good, if you don't call it hard preaching, good hard preaching. Now the fourth kind of instructor was the, the prophet. And the mission of the prophet was to communicate to Israel the divine word from, from God himself. Though they did predict, it may be said of them, so far as their work was concerned, that they were proclaimers rather than predictors. And the fifth kind of instructor of the uh, Old Testament was the psalmist, the poets. And I think you will agree that we have benefited greatly from the uh, poets, the Psalms, for example. <clears throat> you can find there the expressions of deepest emotions and uh, feelings of, of the human spirit. And some uh, reflect or express, many foretell, but all the Psalms seek to glorify God. But we're dealing with prophets, not any of these others. Now, what's the etymology of the word prophet? You know, we think today, I would say by and large we think today, that a prophet is predicting some future event. Well, in a sense, maybe that's right. If, if they uh, declare if one doesn't repent, then you know there's going to be destruction. That is a prediction of a sort. But uh, we kind of think that a prophet is going to say on uh, March the second, uh, 2025, this thing is going to happen. So get prepared for it. But that's not the case. A uniform. Uh, definition is uh, a speaker of and for God. Simply that. His uh, words are not the product, product of his own spirit, but it comes from a higher source. In both the Old and New Testament, a prophet is one who under the influence of the Holy Spirit, speaks the words and the thoughts of God. Whether they relate to the past, to the present, or to the future. And we can learn better what the word prophet means by how it's used in Scripture. God said to Moses that Aaron would be his spokesman. In a sense, that makes him a prophet, a mouthpiece. Also, he said that Aaron would be Moses' prophet, Exodus 7, verse 1. Therefore, as a, as a prophet, he was the spokesperson for uh, Moses, the mouthpiece. God has said on, a, uh, on occasion that when he would uh, raise up a prophet, he's going to put his words into the mouth of that prophet and that that prophet would speak those words in his name. The Hebrew prophet was a, an ambassador of Jehovah sent to make known his will and the purpose, his purpose. And he was to do it to his chosen people. And it was not always to the Jews. Sometimes it was to the uh, heathen. At other times, Jehovah's ambassador uh, was sent to the heathen. And we'll see that in Jonah. Uh, as a spokesman for God, he was more a forth teller than a foreteller. He didn't tell fortunes. 
he just declared what God had uh, told him to say. Now, they did foretell events, that, that's for sure. But this is not the basic meaning or the, the purpose of the prophet. Now, there are different words that are used for prophet that have somewhat the same meaning. And of course, prophet is, is one word. Seer is another word that's used for prophet. Sometimes it's called a man of God, servant of God, the messenger of God, or the watchman. From the prophets, every preacher and teacher of the word of God, and we are students of the word of God, and we should be teaching, we can learn from the prophets. As someone said, there are two classes of preachers, good preachers. There are those who have something to say, and the others who have have to say something. But this third class, those who have something to say, and they have to say it. That's the prophets. God has given them something to say, and they have to say it. You may recall that uh, Jeremiah, he had something to say, and he had to say it because he said, it's like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and so I'm weary with uh, forbearing, holding it in. I can't contain it. I've got to say it. Now, we could go over a list of the uh, prophets that are in uh, the Old Testament. <clears throat> of course, you know, we mentioned Abraham, well, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They foretold things. Miriam, uh, that's uh, Moses' sister, she was called a prophetess. Deborah, the judge, was also described as a prophetess. And they were a, a group of people called uh, uh, Sons of Prophets or the prophetic bands. They roamed around. Of course, Elijah and Elisha were prophets. And there was the prophet judge Samuel. And we recall that Nathan, who confronted uh, David, he was also described as a prophet. And the reason for that is he had something to tell from God to David. Abijah was a prophet to Jeroboam. There's an unnamed prophet called a man of God who was sent to Jerusalem to warn of the results of its apostasy. And during Amos' time, there was a Jehu who declared the doom of Baasha and who rebuked Jehoshaphat for alliance with Ahab. Eliezer, who prophesied against Jehoshaphat. Micaiah, who stood against the false prophet Zedekiah. And Jonah, of the uh, earlier prophets who wrote the book of Jonah, is the advisor to Jeroboam, and of course Elijah and Elisha. They're all prophets. Now, as I said, we will uh, not follow the uh, order of the prophets in as it appears in the Bible, but we'll do it according to chronological order, as best as can be determined or I should say as best as Homer Haley can determine. And we'll list uh, uh, the earliest prophets, the uh, oldest is, appears to be, not sure, but appears to be Obadiah, then Joel, and Jonah. And those are the first three that we'll, that we'll cover. Then after that, 
We'll cover Amos, Hosea, Isaiah. We won't cover Isaiah. He's uh, the piercing there somewhere in Micah between uh, Hosea and, and Micah. <clears throat> Jeremiah appears later. Of course, we will not cover that. Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. Then later still, Ezekiel, we will not cover that, nor Daniel. Then later, Haggai, Zechariah, and of course Malachi is uh, thought to be the very latest of the prophets. Now the three things that uh, we should keep in mind. First, it's necessary, and we may not, as we go through the uh, verses, we'll cover that somewhat. But we need to understand the political, moral, social, and religious conditions at the time in which the uh, prophet lived and preached, and how he proposed to meet these conditions. It'll be observed that whatever the conditions, uh, whatever the conditions, the prophet endeavored to meet them appointing people back to God before reform could be effected their hearts had to be changed towards him a second point that we should uh, consider is that the prophet prophets considered uh, 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 is God's relation to the heathen nations with whom the uh, Jewish people came in contact. You know, the Jews didn't have much uh, uh, interest or care or concern about the heathen nations, but it'll be demonstrated that indeed God had a concern for them. We should always keep in mind that God directs the destiny of not only is his faithful people, but also of those who have no interest in God whatsoever. He also controls their fate. I think the final thing that we need to uh, regard is that the prophet's teaching of a future kingdom and king to be filled in one who was to come, that was Jesus. Whatever the lot of Israel or its king um, of the prophet's day, whatever that was, a lasting kingdom comprised of a spiritual Israel, a spiritual king who should rule in righteousness. That was the true hope of the future. That was the thing that was being pointed to. So we, we should keep these three points in, in mind. And with that, if it weren't such a, a late time, we would start with Obadiah. It's a one-chapter book. So before we uh, take this up again next week, I want to suggest to you that you read it a number of times, not just once, not just twice. You can read it once a day be seven times before next Wednesday night. So I'll leave that uh, with your uh, homework assignment. Read Obadiah every day until we uh, meet again next Wednesday night. Thank you. See you sometime later. <laughs>